Hi everyone, this is BMT 100, Introduction to Tourism and Hospitality Management, Lecture 2. This is actually take three, so uh, I am hoping that this broadcast works better than the first two. Uh, we will get started here, and as you can follow along on the slides that are attached to Moodle, our agenda this week, we're going to be having the lecture on service. I wanted to just mention for a moment uh, the discussion posts. You're doing very well. Uh, remember that you need to incorporate your the material from the reading as well as this lecture now going forward. And I really need you to understand that this needs to be a dialogue between you and your fellow students. So make sure to reply to two others, but continuously weigh in and review the conversations that are taking place in the discussion forum. This is really where you're going to learn uh, a lot of the information from this class. It's going to be solidified in these conversations that you're going to have. Next week, we're going to have, uh, we're going to mix things up a little bit. And instead of the discussion forums in there, in the sense that you've had for this week anyways, and um, last week sort of with the introductory posts, we're going to be doing short papers. But it's going to be based off of the same material. Again, the short paper content should come from uh, your readings, the lecture. You shouldn't have to do any outside research for those papers. Um, and then I wanted to remind everyone you should have hopefully selected the book from the report uh, list. It was at the bottom of the first weeks on Moodle, uh, the, the list of books for you to use for your final report. So let's get into the lecture, which is all about service. So the objectives from the text, uh, we really want to talk about how creating a service culture can lead to competitive advantage. We want to talk about service recoveries and how they impact reputation and repeat business, which really ties into loyalty programs. Um, and this last one is really a statement that is so true. It's the service staff in a hotel or in any hospitality operations is really the number one marketing tool in their respective establishments. So if you think about these iconic, they are, of course, Nordstrom's is known for uh, the, the product that they sell, but they're known for their service. McDonald's, it might not be known for high service, but they have a culture of service. It's consistent, but it's a service culture that exists in, the, in their company that they are known for. Carnival Cruises, Fairmont Hotels, Virgin America, Starbucks, Disney, all of these companies have a service culture that is really a result of their associates, their, their workers, their, their, the frontline associates who on a daily basis create that service culture. So I am um, I'm a uniquely qualified in one way in that I'm a service culture trainer. It's called a next generation service culture training at Starwood, and I am a certified service culture training trainer, but I didn't want to just talk about Starwood. So when I was putting this class together, I was looking around and doing research on other hotel companies, and I, was, I wasn't really surprised, but I was able to find a lot of information on service culture as it exists in other companies as well outside of Starwood. Four Seasons has a huge section of their web page talking about the service culture at their hotels and how they have focused so much of their time and efforts and, and training dollars into um, providing their associates with the information that they need to be able to create that service culture. Another company that is legendary, just like Nordstrom is no, well known for its service, uh, Ritz-Carlton has always been, uh, since its inception, has been known for the uh, the unwavering commitment to service that their associates provide. And it's one thing to mention here, uh, their motto is something that you'll hear in the hotel business, you'll hear it said be, uh, many times, because it's a legendary, it's short, but it's the motto is, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And I, I wanted to share that because it exemplifies the anticipatory service that they provide um, but it also speaks to the fact that they're expecting their team members, their associates, to be um, on the same level as the guests. And so, uh, you know, that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about in a moment. But let's talk about service basics. You have to get these right before you can go to the next level. 
simple things, using their name. Um, the 10 and 5 rule is probably something you might not be familiar with if you're not in the hotel business, but it states that if you're 10 feet from a guest, you acknowledge them, and when you're 5 feet from that guest, you welcome them. So at walking down the hallway, I would make eye contact and nod at 10 feet, and I would say, welcome to the Sheraton at 5 feet. That's the 10 and 5 rule, and that's a service basic, which is foundational. Eye contact. Um, culturally, that can be difficult in some locations and in some situations, but eye contact is a service basic. Listen to understand. We're going to be talking about that when we talk about service recovery, but many times um, we find ourselves not listening to understand. We think we know why people are talking to us. We think we know when we're, when we're talking to a guest or a fellow associate, fellow worker, we think we know what they're saying. We really need to stop and listen to understand, and that's a service basic. Um, and that comes in when we talk about trip personas. And trip personas says every trip is different, and I'm different on every trip. And that is um, something to keep in mind. Our guests at our hotels can oftentimes spend hundreds and hundreds of nights a year with us and can be, become very familiar with our team members. Um, but we have to remember that every trip, they're different. Every trip, they have something different about them. They may be um, traveling for a different reason this week. They may be following a different schedule. Whatever it is, we have to understand who they are and not assume that we know who they are. Their trip personas change over time. And then walk five with a guest is another service basic. Um, like the 10 and 5 rule, maybe not one that you hear frequently. But in the service industry, walk five with the guest means that if I'm in the lobby and a guest approaches and says, where's the grand ballroom? Instead of just pointing in the direction of the ballroom, I will actually walk five paces towards the ballroom with the guest as I'm describing how they will go to the escalators and go up to the second floor. It's just a foundational service basic. And this is a beginning of the list of service basics that you really have to have right from the beginning before you can move to the next level. Now, as we transition into service recovery, a lot of the same things come into play. Um, but one thing that I wanted to point out here was service netting, service recovery that is fixing a problem we didn't create. So in service netting, if I come to the front desk and say, oh, I can't believe it. I have a presentation to give this morning in front of the board of directors and I forgot to pack a tie. Uh, that front desk associate going in back and, and finding a tie for me and bringing it out and giving it to me to wear. That's an example of service netting, solving issues that weren't created by that establishment. Um, that is one way to, uh, to drive an immense amount of loyalty to your business because it does create a, a, the guests in their minds, you're taking care of them uh, beyond what would be expected. Service recovery also, uh, listen to understand, as I talked about in service basics, but listen and empathize. Uh, there's a big difference here between empathize and sympathize. So let me just share a story. If a guest calls down and says, the hot water isn't working in my room, if the person who answers the phone sympathizes with that guest, sympathize means that you take on that person's feelings, that you take on their emotions. So that person who sympathizes with the guest would say, oh, I can't believe that's happening again. That is just so frustrating. That's sympathizing. That's the wrong way to recover that situation. Empathize would be to understand the emotions that that guest is feeling, but not to take them on as your own. So to say, Oh, I am so sorry to hear that the water is not working in your room, Mr. Smith. I can understand how that would make you feel. Please let me have somebody uh, come up to your room to try to fix it immediately. In the meantime, I do have a vacant room I can have you move into to take your shower. That would be empathizing in a service recovery situation versus sympathizing. Empowerment. Empowerment to make it right. It's so critical that the service provider that the frontline associate is empowered to be able to make it right so that they don't have to go through three levels of bureaucracy to get the approval 
to give you back your money if you're not happy with the service. Um, and that's something that the best um, service culture companies uh, ensure is in place, is empowerment. Now, this is one of those things when I was designing this course, I didn't, like I said, want to focus too much on Starwood, but I did feel that this was important. And I did find this is uh, generally available knowledge. It's not something that's, it, it, whether it's proprietary or not, it's on the internet, so I can talk about it. And it's the human truths at Starwood. We use the human truths when we're training our, our associates on the service culture, and they apply not only to our guests, but to our associates. Um, and so these are the need to be understood, wanting to belong, the longing to feel special, craving more control over our lives, and we dream of reaching our potential. So the reason that these are here and the reason that we use these when we talk about service culture, service recovery, um, and service basics is that we apply these in everything that we do, or we try to apply these, and we try to remind ourselves to continually remember that these are our truths that we have to acknowledge. Um, so as an example, we need to understand our guests. We need to understand our fellow associates. We can't deliver any of the other human truths in, unless we understand them. Um, we have that longing to, or that, that need, that want to belong to something bigger than ourselves. And so when we talk about the wanting to belong to something in a service recovery situation, we want our guests to feel like they believe um, that ties into the next one. We want them to feel special. It also ties into the next one on the list, which is we want them to have more control over their lives. So rather than giving them the, the standard um, cookie cutter response when they come down to complain about something, we want them to feel special and that they have control over their lives. So we will listen to them. We will empathize with them. We will give them control to help understand what we could do differently to make them feel happy about the situation. And then we dream of reaching our potential. And that's something that we um, focus on with our associates, perhaps more than our guests, but it's so important because we, we all want to reach our potential and we want to help one another get there. So this all ties into loyalty programs. Very few companies nowadays do not have some type of loyalty program in place. And the reason is, honestly, it's so much more expensive to get new customers than it is to retain loyal customers. Um, so if you have a loyal customer who comes back 100 nights a year and stays at your hotel, you don't have to market to that person. You don't have to send them uh, emails trying to get them to come and try your product. You don't have to do market research to find out where they're shopping. You don't have to um, spend money to, to get them in the door. They're already there. And when they're there, they're actually spending more money than the other guests who are not loyal. They're staying longer, they're telling their friends, and they're actually doing something that you might not think we would want them to do, but we do. They're complaining more. And you might ask yourself, well, why would I want a guest who's complaining more? Well, a loyal guest is going to complain, and that's because they know who you are. They're loyal to your company. They know that the issue that they're complaining about is something that you could do better at and they want you to fix it because they want to remain loyal to you. Whereas a non-loyal guest, if there's something that happens um, that they're not happy about, they may just leave and go to another company and never tell you why they were unhappy. Um, we talked about uh, that sense of belonging and loyalty programs really do create that environment of belonging for guests and customers that is so important. So the loyalty programs we're going to talk a lot more about in week 10 um, when we talk about marketing. But I did want to just mention that loyalty programs are like an arms race in that once one company does one thing, once one of the hotel companies rolls out a new program or a new offer, all of the other companies um, immediately ante up to, to remain in the game. And so I went out and looked at some of the other companies. Marriott Rewards, as an example, has a lot of really interesting benefits that one of the things they actually have the opportunity for guests to earn points on social media. So likes and 
retweets and um, you know and G pluses on Google Plus. All of those things enable guests to earn points, which is an interesting thing. Now, other companies that I'm aware of have not yet started that, um, but there are a lot of of other programs that are very similar um, and. These companies, as this next slide shows with Hilton, um, they'll offer things such as it earning triple points um, or special dates when you can earn double points. Uh, that type of marketing program is easily replicated. So uh, as an example with Starwood, they may follow the lead of Hilton and offer triple points and Marriott may do the same. And it's just a continuous arms race, if you will, um, with trying to keep up and, and innovate, out-innovate the competition, if you will. The next one, Starbucks. There's a huge um, following, loyal following of Starbucks. And we know that the app and the card have a lot to do with that. People really like the convenience of the app or the card, um, but it, it drives business to Starbucks. Uh, people do like Starbucks beyond just the, the app and the card, don't get me wrong, but there is a, a certain draw that people have when they have that in their wallet or they have it on their phone and they can swipe the card and, and be recognized for who they are. And so that's just another example of a, of a very successful loyalty program. So service is uh, utilized as a marketing tool. And um, so online reputation management, when we are um, looking at our online status, if you will, how we rank on TripAdvisor, um, how we rank on the various review sites, those are used to market the hotel. And on the flip side of that, when there's a negative um, online posting review, the hotels, all hotel companies nowadays, uh, invest a lot of time and money in managing those online reviews and responding accordingly. Service marketing mix, um, you'll learn more about in the textbook, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but um, the, the marketing of service is really an important component um, to be able to read the guest and understand who they are and what the, is important to them, and then turn around and market to that guest. So one of the things that I have here on the slide now is called Moments of Truth. Um, and that's a book by Jan Carlson, and he was the president and CEO of Scandinavia Airline. And I love this philosophy that he had. And he was one of the first, or his company was one of the first, not the first, but one of the first companies to realize um, what impact an associate interaction with a guest has on the overall company. And he called these moments of truth. So in his example, that 15 seconds, he was in the airline business, remember? So that 15 seconds that you as a customer are dealing with that ticket agent at the desk before you get on the plane, that 15 seconds is critical to the success of your entire company. It doesn't matter how much you're spending on marketing or how much you're spending on the airplanes or how much you're saving in gas. If you can't get it right in those 15 seconds with that agent at the desk and that associate, you're not in the right business. You're not doing the right thing. And so that Moments of Truth, this is one book that is recommended. Uh, it's in the list of, of options for you to read, um, but it's a great book just about the importance of focusing on that guest in that particular moment of time and taking the care of their needs then. Uh, this last slide for this week's uh, lecture is the Kano analysis. You would not see this too often in, um, in loyalty programs, but I think it's important for you to see this. This is something that I used a lot of. This type of tool was used a lot in the innovation work that I did previously with Starwood um, in my last position. And so if you follow along, the red line that is across the top here, um, you have is a is a new innovation is introduced to uh, to the company. So imagine, if you will, it's 1981, and there are no coffee makers in any hotels um, except perhaps the suites of the of the highest end hotels in the world. And I'm a hotelier, and I decide I'm going to put a coffee maker, a small size coffee maker, in every one of my guest rooms. 
That immediately becomes a delighter. Guests are extremely satisfied by the fact that I have put a coffee maker in the rooms. They find that no other company does it. Um, and it's every time they see a coffee maker in, in your hotel, excited about it. It's a simple, but it's a true example of a Kano analysis. Because over time, other hotel companies put coffee makers in their rooms. And over time, that becomes a basic need. And you really don't get satisfied when you see a coffee maker um, in the room. You get dissatisfied if it's not there, but you're not satisfied when it's there. It just becomes a basic need. And so, as that blue call out says, over time, delight, delightful innovations become another basic need. Well, that is an important thing to keep in mind with this type of loyalty program, with this type of uh, service culture training these things over time become basics and they uh, there's continuously a need and companies spend a lot of time and energy focusing on what is the next big thing what is the next innovation that they can put into place that will become the delighter um, which will of can over time uh, just move into a basic need for the guests so uh, this concludes the lecture number two for BMT 100. Uh, thank you so much for your patience so far with the technical difficulties we've had with these uh, sessions. I hope the audio quality on this broadcast is much better than the previous two that I've taken tonight. And I certainly hope that uh, you understand uh, the, and appreciate the um, fact that, that we will make this session very successful. Um, but we do. I do need you to make sure that you're having very active conversations in the uh, discussion forums for this learning to, to really gel and take place. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening, and we'll talk next week.